So you think that General Armstrong had something to do with General Raven's disappearance? It seems so. Yeah, he's in concrete. However, she's They're too closing smart in. to leave any evidence behind. Yeah, she is. Well, anyway, the only thing we have to worry about is holding down this fort. These guys don't realize how much danger they're in with this crew at Briggs. Nice, General they finally Armstrong. meet. How nice to see you. They posted you in Central Mustang. You're well connected. No, it's solely based on merit. That's rich coming from you. It's partly merit, I guess. Fuhrer Bradley summoned me for an extended stay, I imagine. Is that so? Well, sometime we should grab some dinner. Your treat? I hope you know I could eat you into bankruptcy. Uh, maybe we should skip dinner then. I see. You're short on both money and nerve. <laughs> maybe I could yeah, offer some money. instead. He's got a lot of those. There are many fine florists here in Central. I love how Roy masks all his hidden moves as dates. Sir! This is interesting, just seeing them meet each other, because this is going to be a clash of two extreme personalities. I can imagine this going any number of ways. I feel like Armstrong isn't the kind of person to, to bite her tongue, which puts her in a lot of danger. Just what have you done? I won't be able to hide it all. Pardon me, Your Excellency, but I simply don't understand how you can employ someone as careless and incompetent as General Raven. Is that the reason you saw fit to dispose of him? Surely you don't need him. Wow. It can't be good to have right out in the open. Talkative on your senior staff. That's what I said, yeah. You have He's sort of a weak link. General, what did Raven say? Immortality. The history of this country. Damn. Your identity. This is really smart, all actually. Sorts of things without any prompting. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I assume you'll be needing someone to fill that fool's vacant seat. Wow. <laughs> well played. Interesting. I like the way you play. Yeah, exactly. Very well. You can have General Raven's seat. Very, very interesting. In hindsight, that is really clever because Bradley, I don't know if this is a weakness or not, but it's definitely something he's done in the past where he's sort of confident in his position and his ability to control things, even though he knows when people are opposed to him, just as long as he has some kind of insurance, which I guess he does have over Armstrong because he has all the Briggs and she obviously, I mean, that's probably the one thing that she really cares about. But man, I love how she played that. Raven really was terrible. Like he was a terrible ally. You don't want someone like that on your team. And Bradley already knew that and Armstrong probably knew he knew that. So she just went from being in extreme danger to being promoted, I guess, in a way. And she didn't bite her tongue, but she did it in a way that wasn't harmful to herself so far. And I'm sure someone like Bradley who has to deal with political crap all day, every day, and people kind of kissing his feet, appreciates the frankness, appreciates people who actually can just talk out in the open like this. And he also must be tired of weak people because all this upper brass, like they don't seem very important to the whole plan. None of them seem like they have the, the something extra that Bradley has or Armstrong has. They're just pawns. To steal a tiger's cubs, you have to enter her den. And it seems like the general's landed herself right in the middle of it. Yeah, and now this place is theirs too. But still, there's one thing they don't know. There's a lot they don't Although know. Although our leader might be gone, we still stand as one. Right. We act with one will. That's the Fort Briggs way. <clears throat> From here on, the bears will fight the tigers. Nice. Episode 40, Homunculus, the dwarf in the flask. Okay. Is this spot taken? No. Well, apparently. Scar is up in the north. The Elric brothers are up there as well. I see. My former classmates Lucy and Ian are stationed up there. They like to keep me informed. Hmm. Miles. Buccaneer. Okay. And York, Ida, and Sugar all spoke to her too. Very elaborate code. Then Uni and Lucy again. <laughs> Uni once more. And then Sterling. So <laughs> what? That is the most <laughs> elaborate code. <laughs> Genius. I'd say impossible. But then, there is no such thing. What in the world is about to happen here in Central? Yeah, a lot, I think. Hey, look who it is. What does he do all day? He just sits here? Young man. Oh no! It's all right. 
Can't you at least bring yourself to act a little surprised or something? What do I get for acting surprised? Mm, you show no fear. What is happening like right that. now? Wait, wait, wait. So this is father's father's flashback. We don't know who this is. It could be young Hohenheim. It could not be young Hohenheim. That little dark blob could be pride. Homunculus in a flask. I'm number 23. Not your number. I want you to tell me your real name. I'm a slave. I don't have one. You are the one who gave me blood, right? I think I'll give you a name of your own. Give me a name? Who are you? You'll want a noble sounding one, right? Let's see. Theo. Theophrastus Bombastus. That's too long. Cool name. Well, how about Von? Von Hohenheim. How does that sound? So Von Hohenheim, huh? Don't you even want freedom? Are you going to live out the rest of your life as a slave without the rights of a real man? This is a very precocious blob. What do I call you? I'll tell you what, Von Hohenheim. You can call me the dwarf in the flask, homunculus. Whoa, okay. So, <laughs> this gives a lot of credit to the idea that father is von Hohenheim, but they operate separate bodies, right? So that means at some point, something went wrong with their alchemy that split them in some way. Maybe it might be similar to something that happened with Al, but they have two bodies, which is weird. Another weird thing about this is, again, we shift the power a little bit. Like, now it seems like pride is sort of the origin. Pride comes from van Hohenheim slash father, I guess, but pride's definitely taking the lead here on this whole thing. It's the next time music. All things are made from one, and in the end, all things return to one. In other words, one is all. Indeed, and all is one as Oh, well. and he's the narrator's voice. All is ultimately of the one. So if all is not included in the one, then all is nothing. You have passed. What does that mean? All is ultimately of the one, so if all is not included in the one, all is nothing. What is that? All is ultimately of the one, but if all is not included in the one, then all is nothing. Seems like he's saying all is one, but one is not all, which is different from how we've heard it. I guess in this case, one is the source of all things, and all is the reflection of the source. But I guess what that means is life and the natural world and human experience is secondary to the one, or maybe the truth or something like that. So it's illusory compared to the one, if that makes sense. I hope they talk about this more. You are now an alchemist, Hohenheim. Well done, child. I'm still only fit to be an assistant. My skill is nothing near yours, master. Who's the master here? I live as well as I do now because of the knowledge you gave me. And I've also earned the master's respect. Thanks okay. to you, maybe someday, I'll even be able to get married and have a family. You will. A family, huh? We live for the bonds that we form with friends and family members. That's who we humans are. Sure. Whatever you say. Okay, then. What is it that makes you happy? Well, I'd hate to be guilty of asking too much, but I think I'd be happy if I could just leave this flask. I don't want to ask for too much, but uh, could you arrange a giant country in the shape of a circle to use as a sacrifice for something God-related? If it's not too much trouble. Why would someone who already has so much power and prosperity need such a thing? Watch your tongue! You are in the royal presence. If you continue with this insolence, I will smash your flask! You wouldn't dare to destroy such an important source of knowledge. That's enough chatter. Immortality. Tell me, is it possible or isn't it? Growing impatient in your old age? Is this How the leader before King of Xerxes? Bradley? Oh, it's Xerxes! Okay, I'll tell you how you can achieve immortality. So Xerxes was the beginning. That makes Hohenheim really old, right? But I guess he doesn't age, so... Wait, now I'm thinking that there's that sage from Xerxes, right? Could that be Hohenheim slash and or father? So it seems like that's taking shape a little bit. This king is gonna die. Pride is gonna get free. Hohenheim is gonna ally with Pride. They're gonna destroy Xerxes for some mission. And that's gonna start this whole this whole journey into the, the continent to create a mistress. The missing piece still is what exactly they're after. And I'm guessing it has something to do with what he said about how all is nothing. What are you digging here for? Uh, irrigation canals. The right. kings ordered them to be dug all throughout the country. <laughs> That's right. the king for you. He even cares about the well-being of us commoners. Nope. Yes, he does. There must be no survivors. Let's show them how much we care about them. Hurry. So it's that kind of irrigation canal. Got it. What an awful tragedy. 
Really hiding your feelings there, Pride. This is it. Everything is ready? Yes. You may now become immortal. The moon again. What's the actual plan? This is immortality. No, no, you must be wrong. <laughs> I don't understand it. You said if we were in the center of the circle, we wouldn't be armed. It's not immortality for you. The true center of the transmutation circle is right here where you're standing. It is? Surely you remember that your blood is within me. I used it to open the doorway. You and I are at the center of everything. Whoa. It's so weirdly beautiful, even though it's terrible. the end of Xerxes. In classic Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood fashion, this answers so much, but raises more questions at the same time. So first, I guess, answers. We see von Hohenheim's origin, and he started from truly humble beginnings, which is, which is pretty cool. And he was rewarded for his faith and pride, and for his diligence, and for whatever circumstances that led to Pride's birth through Hohenheim's blood. We also see that Pride is, was sort of running the show, at least from the beginning, and we also see the origin of these circles. It was not human research, it was like something like accidentally creating a different consciousness that explained it to them, which is kind of interesting thematically. Which leads me to the questions, which are, what exactly were the circumstances of what Hohenheim did that led to pride, or the little thing in the flask, or whatever it's called, coming into existence and having this kind of knowledge? It almost feels like an angel or something like that, or a demon or something that they accidentally uncovered that spread the knowledge of the divine, but in a really terrible, twisted way. So what exactly is that? How did it happen? And also, what does it, what does it mean? Then, Hohenheim has immortality, right? They did this at Xerxes. Why are they continuing to do it in a greater and greater scale? It seems like they want something more than immortality. And also, where does father come into the equation? But yeah, just as a small note, that scene was awesome. It was really beautifully done. It was somehow moving even though it's evil, you know what I mean? No, he's dead. They all are. He must be the sage, right? McDonald! Reinmeier! Tony! There must be someone left. It's no use. Not here. All of their souls have been taken from them. Majesty! Are you alright? Tell me. Your body. How is it feeling? It's me. Impossible. That's father. Using your blood, I created a receptacle for myself. Nice. Okay, that explains that. <laughs> Thank you for your blood. I've given you a name, and I've given you knowledge. And now, I've given you a body that will live forever. I'm immortal. Focus your attention within yourself, Hohenheim. You hear them, don't you? The voices of all the people in this country who were offered in exchange for mm. your immortality. I thought the names he mentioned just now sounded familiar. I'm guessing maybe it was the same names he mentioned when he pulled souls from himself during the flashback a few episodes ago. Well, half of their lives were for me, actually. <coughs> I appreciate your That's a heavy weight to carry. <laughs> Wow, okay, so I think I misunderstood. That thing in the flask is not pride necessarily, it was just like the origin of the homunculi, and that became father, and then father split aspects of himself into the various homunculi, pride being the most powerful and the most representative of his true form, maybe. One thing that this scene did for me is I think I kind of assumed that Hohenheim was sort of the master 
mastermind or visionary who created all this and then at some point decided he didn't like it and deviated from it but now thinking about him he seems kind of low like it really wasn't him that did this he seems to have sort of lucked into it with an experiment that just went far beyond what he expected so he's kind of helpless which continues the trend of like starting out with Hohenheim being this ultimate figure and then becoming more and more human and sympathetic and I think it explains some of his reflection right like he obviously walked away from that whole thing I mean, probably a lot happened because there's a lot of time in between then and now, but he tried to live a normal life, but this must have been weighing on him. And I'm wondering if that flashback episode, the recap episode, wasn't him sort of coming to terms with his responsibility in the whole thing. Van Hohenheim? I knew it. <sighs> huh. Interesting pairing. Finally, I get the chance to meet Ed and Al's father. And I finally get to meet the one who taught my sons. I'm sure they must have been a handful. Oh, no. They were fine boys. <coughs> what is it? Izumi, are you all right? Let me get your medicine. May I have a look at her? I know a bit about the medical field. Cure, Hohenheim. Find us a car, quickly. <coughs> Hurry! Right. I'm on it. <coughs> you have seen the truth. <sighs> what did you sacrifice? A lot. Please be honest with me. My insides were taken. I was trying to bring my child back to life. I see. Yes. I see. I'm sorry. <laughs> no! Why? No, he's healing her. He's healing her. He's healing her. He's healing her. Izumi, hang on! Izumi! Calm down, dear, please. I'm all right. He shoved his hand into you. But my breathing, oh. it's easy. Oh. Thank you. How can that be? What a fake out. They didn't get me. Never got me for a second. Suzumi, you cannot give in to your fate just yet. You are the boy's father. But who... who are you? He's the sage am I? of Xerxes. I am a philosopher's stone in the form of a man. That's what I am. Ultimate power. That episode, though, that was a lot. The sorcerer's stone. End credit scene. The celestial stone. The grand elixir. The philosopher's stone is known by many names. It's not necessarily a stone. The one Dr. Marco had was a semi-liquid form. The one that Kimberly has is similar to a crystal, and it's about this big. The one Hohenheim has is his body. To create a Philosopher's Stone that big, you'd have to kill thousands of people. Maybe it's possible, but I would never want to see it. Well, don't look at your father. What's bigger than Hohenheim that they could be making? Mega Hohenheim! <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I was right all along that it's just a mecha philosopher's stone. So yeah, obviously that was a huge episode. It's kind of insane and I feel like I need a little bit more to think about exactly what it all means. Like one of my theories from the beginning has been that all the evil has been human evil and maybe I'm wrong about that. You know, maybe it was just like they just touched something that they shouldn't have touched and they opened a door that shouldn't have been opened in the form of the, the flask thing. They sort of let a demon out. I don't know if we'll get it, but I'd like to know a little bit more about that process and what actually happened. So I feel like there might be some interesting stuff there. It's also really interesting to make the connection, what I'm assuming is the connection that Hohenheim is the sage of Xerxes because you can imagine he wandered the earth trying to do good I guess or, or spreading something spreading knowledge or healing people or whatever like some kind of religious prophet we see he has the ability to heal but at some point he abandoned that for a normal life which he of course can't have and he, he's he can't forget about his origin and the things he's left behind. It explains pretty much everything about Hohenheim, I think. Like, it explains why he warned Pinaco. He's always known. It explains who Father is, and it explains what the homunculi are in greater detail, and maybe why Pride is the most powerful of them all. It seems like Pride is the truest one. Pride looks like what the thing in the flask looks like. There are some questions raised for me in terms of ideas and themes. Like, I'm really interested in what Hohenheim said about how all is nothing, because that seems different from how we've heard it. And you know, it's not like there's nothing to that. Like, if everything is the same, if everything is one, then it's almost like none of those things matter. Well, actually, the way I thought about this before is the other way around. Like, when people talk about a higher power, like God or something, sometimes they'll say it's just everything. But if it's everything, it's also nothing, because you're adding nothing new. You're not pointing to anything new, you're just being more general and raising the layer of observation to include everything. But it's still 
just everything. It's still just all. How do you flip that? I guess it works the other way too if you see the reality as oneness, if that's how you experience things, as like totality. Then the all is nothing either because you're just narrowing the lens to be more specific. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm just trying to piece this together here. I guess more importantly for me is the question of, well, what's the significance of that thought? Because that scene wasn't accidental. So I'm definitely going to be thinking about that and looking out for it and hoping that they cover that more because I have a feeling that's that's important. But anyway, that's the best I can do for now. It's really complicated. So I'll see you next time for episode 41. <laughs>